<laughs> Cheers. Will, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, dude. Official. Um, I know this has been in the works and you've kind of been there from the beginning right? as far as like getting it going. But we were chatting before this. The Formula One races are going on currently. They are. We are approaching the end of the championship. It's been Max Verstappen's won it. He's clinched the victory and Red Bull is ahead by a significant margin. But there's still some uh, some interesting battles going on in like second and third there's some battles and then in the drivers championships as well there's some uh there's some very close battles for yeah there's a battle for second and then a battle for fifth i guess how long have you been tracking this so i got into it uh i feel like a lot of people get into it when you watch drive to survive on netflix great great that documentary <laughs> it's really good even if you're like not even interested a little bit in cars it's still kind of cool to watch it so one of my uh really good friends taylor uh, called me up and was like, "Hey, if you're not doing anything, check this uh, check this series out." And I looked it up and was hooked immediately, and then started following the live races. And so I've been following since 2019. And then yeah, yeah. And then you went to uh... went to Monaco recently. That was, was oh my gosh, the most like that's like the big one. I know the U.S. races for some reason are just super expensive, but Monaco that's the glitzy one. That's what this Las Vegas Grand Prix that's going on this weekend. That's what they want it to be yeah. is uh, just the, like all the the yachts, the money. When I was walking around there, like the cars that I was just seeing in the streets, there's Bugattis, Aston Martins. Like I'm sure they were like within like the hundreds of that were made of that kind of car. I I guarantee it. And just the amount of wealth that was around that kind of atmosphere. But it was it was super cool just to see that kind of historic track because it's it's not the most exciting race it did yeah. get exciting because it rained which is it's not common so it was really cool that i was there and it rained and like there was a, a driver he made impact with the wall like just behind where i was standing i was like oh shit that's, 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 oh god yeah i was like <laughs> head whipped around so fast because they're like you you watch you still watch the race like on a tv because you can only see like so much so many like maybe three of the 12 to 17 corners that are on the racetrack but right you still are watching on the TV, but then all of a sudden like cars are ripping by you and you're just like, Oh shit. And then you see your driver and you're like, yes, it's Carlos. It's my guy. Carlos Sainz. Ferrari. Ferrari. Yes. Dude. They, uh, they had a little incident <sighs> today. Oh my gosh. Just how much do those cars run? So what do you mean? Like cost? Oh, millions, millions that, that, so for people who don't know what, what happened, so it's the Las Vegas Grand Prix and, this is the first time they're running in, I don't know how many years, been like 20 years, but the first time on this circuit that like runs down the main, like Las Vegas straight, which is super cool. goes past this, like the big sphere that they just built. Mm -hmm. Um, well, in order to have the track ready for these cars, which use certain types of aerodynamics called ground force, they had to like reinforce all the manhole covers and the drain covers. Well, one of the Ferrari drivers, Carlos Sainz drove over one of these manhole covers and the force of the car was so strong, it ripped the, it was welded down, but it ripped the concrete up and this thing punched a hole in his car and caused, he had to t change his power unit, his battery, the chassis, like there was a hole big enough you could see the floor, like the, through the road, see the road through the car, like a lot of damage. And he got to take, he got a penalty for having to replace all the parts, even though it was like, not, not his, his fault, fault at yeah. all. Like, it's not like he hit the wall. He was driving straight. And just all of a sudden, like the videos you see are just like all of a sudden sparks. And That's what like, I saw. I was while I was waiting for you to come over, yeah. I was watching Instagram and it's like the car's going down the strip and all it's like all of a, a sudden. Fireball. And it's like it's not uncommon to see sparks underneath cars. But like all of a sudden, like like that, it was just not not a good time. So what did the penalties look like? So it's a. You have a certain number of power units you can use per season. And so once you go past, I think it's like either three or five, um, then you start taking grid penalties. So uh, the race weekend, you you qualify for the race. You go, have a couple of practice sessions and then everybody tries, tries to drive as fast as they can. Qualifying session to determine the race order. Well, after that's been established, if you have to replace your power unit, your battery, anything like that, you'll take grid good grid. grid grid place penalties yeah and uh so he has a 10 place grid place penalty so even if he qualified first place pole position he He's would start 10th 11th 11th oh my yeah it's a lot of ground to gain pain 
Yeah. It's pain on a street circuit that they've never raced before. And like the drivers were talking on like, oh, it's way different than the sim racing that they've done on it. Because they, they try to do practice laps to mm-hmm. kind of get at least some kind of muscle memory down. Because these there it's the conditioning and the training they go through is insane. It's all kinds of different aspects they, they focus on. Yeah, I try to get into it. The problem, like even UFC, like I watch the UFC pretty frequently, but like even that I find it like it doesn't end up well with my schedule. So anytime sure. there's a race, I'm like, oh, I'm working or I've got this. Yeah. Anytime there's a fight, it's like, oh, I'm working. I've got something this. going on. Yeah, it's pretty frustrating. But yeah. Yeah. So other than uh, an avid follower of Formula One, what do you do? Um, I h- love to hike being in Colorado. Um, I'm so sure. I just want for the record, you followed. Well, I followed John. Yes. Yeah, so and then you followed me. We should, yeah, we should explain how we know each other, I guess. So yeah. uh, we are high school buddies. Uh, we met through some mutual friends. Holly no, Springs man, high I, school. honestly, like it was that lunch group. Yeah, we were sitting at lunch. I was a new kid, relatively new kid. Yeah, uh, I was new. I was there before Kalen DePaulo because I remember Kalen coming after me. Yeah, but like it was John and Cameron that was pretty much. That was my connection to, to everybody else in that group, Sean, and yeah. then your brother. So Yeah, and then we just jumped in. Then we stopped mm-hmm. talking for like a long time. Man. Yeah, we well, I mean, Wilmington. that's tough. Like, you off to college, and like, unless you go to the school. Where'd you go? I went to Wilmington, UNC Wilmington. For how long? Uh, four years. Okay. Four years in a semester. A little half victory lab. A little party city. It is, yes. But, yeah, graduated exercise science and that, that was the other thing is i was trying to trying to figure out my life and yeah I moved up to connecticut for a little while you were in the military so was yeah we, yeah. Did, we both just kind of went our separate ways and it was so strange i don't did you reach out to me i think so because you ended up wanting to come to colorado yes i had been looking like so was up in connecticut for a while 2018 bunch of stuff happened that made me kind of pivot figure reevaluate life see what i wanted to do and I, i'd always wanted to move out here it's a matter of finding a job that would bring me here so once i found that i was like hey i knew that you were here i didn't think i think i just found out john had moved too like it, that was like yeah. a pretty recent development because i remember you visiting me and yes being like oh john's here too and yeah i was, like, I was oh that's pretty because i completely lost track with that whole group everybody yeah. like I, I checked in with like alex alex sherman every once in a while but that was about yeah. it I talk to the guys on discord from time to time yeah that was i'm not a pc gamer so that was it was hard for me to like stay involved in that because mm-hmm. it's like i don't i'd have to have discord and then be on yeah whatever so you went to under well let's so high school holly springs high school high, go yeah, golden Hawks. <laughs> uh after graduation you go immediately to wilmington walk yeah. me through that so yeah i went to wilmington um i thought i was going to go into physical therapy because i played soccer growing up uh, all throughout middle school high school um, I never got hurt, but I had friends who did. So I was like, oh, when they came back, like they were, they were so happy. So I was like, oh, if I can help people do that, that's what I want to do. So I thought physical therapy was a the route I wanted to go, um, up in Connecticut. I was dating somebody at the time, how it always goes. She had a connection to a physical therapy clinic that I and eventually started working at as a physical therapy tech while I applied to those schools. Mm-hmm. It's a very competitive market. There's a ton of people trying to become physical therapists. Is it a, uh, is it a doctorate program or it master's? Is a, or? It is a clinical doctorate. So it's a three year doctorate program. Um, you have to have a bachelor's degree and all the prereqs, but then I think you, you do publish research in your program, but you are not a doctor. How was your college experience? Um, I think it was, well, I had undiagnosed ADHD going to, college so i had that fun experience of having to self-regulate and like dedicate time to study yeah. and that was why like my first semester surprised i got the grades i did but undergrad then, undergrad yeah okay. second second semester was when i was like i'm nobody's account i'm accountable to myself and that's it and it was fantastic and then they were like oh wait no there are comp- there are repercussions to your actions so had to take some time came back in with a more focused approach. And that was when I found physical therapy, uh, exercise science, which you can do a lot of stuff with. You can become a personal trainer, kinesiology, you can go into research. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Uh, it's a very, very, uh, flexible degree. How was, 
And then so you spend your time in a beach town. Oh, yeah. Super nice climate. Oh, yeah. It was great. I loved it. It was... I do miss the beach. Like, I... Growing up, I'd spend a ton of time at the, deep, at the beach with my parents. Yeah. Like, we had a timeshare every summer. We'd go down there. It was one of our big kind of family vacations. So being able to go down the beach was awesome. And like a scuba dive before I got into anesthesia. Where at? Uh, all over. I've been to a lot of um, St. Thomas, uh, Bahamas. But then uh, one of my graduation presents for my parents, we went to Belize. Which is okay. super cool. I was thinking like the Outer Banks area. I was like, that water's pretty murky. It is murky, but there's a ton of shipwrecks out there. So okay. off the Atlantic coast, it's called the the graveyard of the Atlantic. So that's where uh, Blackbeard ship ended up. Okay. Before it ended up in, a, or yeah, before it was in a museum. Did you ever find any pirate gold? No gold, but I've I've done some shipwreck diving. That's that's really cool. Most of the ships are pretty broken apart, but there's still some that are like the Speckle Grove is one that's pretty intact, and mm-hmm. I think a, a hurricane back in like. 2016 or something like actually stood it upright it was at like 135 feet of depth and then they it literally the tide pushed the shipwreck upright so now it's only like 65 feet that's pretty dope yeah it's cool it cha- it completely changed the certificates you need to go dive it because otherwise you need like deep water certification nitrox diving like a lot of experience and they're like oh no no 65 feet anybody can do that you just have to pass your the dive certification basically and that one's more intact it is yeah so you okay. can like swim through parts of it and you can still find some like little trinkets and stuff a lot of it gets picked over I was about, how does that work because if you find a trinket are you allowed to take it absolutely it? yeah there's there's a whole community of people in wilmington that like there's just old retired divers that go looking for like megalodon teeth there's a an area that we call like megalodon ledge that we'd take dives like dive trips to and yeah people just find these teeth that they sell for like thousands of dollars holy shit on ebay yeah, and they're like they're the big ones they're oh the, yeah they're cool could you imagine if that thing was still alive yeah i was just watching uh it's like our our planet on netflix it's <laughs> great but it was like how terrifying would it be if like we're we take being the apex predator for granted it's so like that's what all horror movies are is like what if something could kill us very easily yeah like, oh no we are not as safe as we think we i are. don't feel safe in the ocean Oh, no, you shouldn't. I know. I mean, if you ever... anytime I'm on a cruise, I'm like, if I fall off, I'm dead. <laughs> like instantaneously. Right. Like, I know I'm going to I could swim for a little bit. My yeah. body fat's pretty low, so I'd probably sink. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Swimming's a struggle for us right. dense people. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I feel like. I would get eaten by sharks, even yeah, though like, I know in the middle of the ocean. It's very like it's very unlikely. Yeah, there's not a ton of stuff at shallow depths way out in the ocean because it's not safe to be out there um but yeah, like at night that's when all the yeah the kraken come out and the big ass the megalodons they come out but no if you ever look at like do you think they're still around i don't i talked to my buddy about this and I, and, and so that we are pretty sur- we don't know anything about the ocean oh no we've explored like three percent or two percent of the ocean yeah. like it's so so alien like every time we go deep we find new things that we can't explain so do you think they're around I don't think so because I don't think any any predators that big still exist. I think the 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 non predatory species like I think there'd be a lot more things like whales out there that they would eat. Have you heard of the uh there's a mathematical equation yeah, as far as it, like in the deepest depths of the ocean they're not confined they're not by confined. gravity so yeah. they can become as big as they want to. Yeah. And I, that's like you see squids that are that big yeah. and like so why jellyfish. Not a I mean, it's not impossible. That is for sure out there. I'm sure there's something big out there that there's like only a handful of, but there only needs to be a handful of, because otherwise it would be over predation. I think they control their <laughs> own population. How fucking terrifying is that? It's dude? absolutely terrifying. But no, like if you look at any like aerial footage of beaches, you see sharks. Oh, they're they're the out there. They yeah. just don't come up close to us because we're not we're not fish yeah it's too hard to get us until you're on a boogie board until you're on a boogie board and doing your best seal impression yeah (laughs) exactly and then it just (laughs) and then you get a a cool they make a movie about you when you punch it in the face yeah i would panic oh everybody yeah everybody thinks that they can like take a shark i guarantee you as soon as you lose oh god boom dead 
it's like a bear too, man. Like if I saw a bear and it started mauling me. Yeah. No, I love that statistic. It's like 65% of men or something like that. Think they could take a grizzly bear in a fight. I'm like, the fuck you could. No way. No way. Those things are like over a thousand pounds. You would get hit once and they would break your entire rib cage. Dude. I ask Kaylee this or I tell Kaylee this all the time. Every time we go hiking. Yeah. I'm like, listen, I've got 18 rounds. It's only nine millimeter. I'm not going to make this. No. But I'm going to shoot off all 19 rounds. And then I'm going to go to my pocket knife. And I'm going to try you take to fight the kids. this. You run. As much as possible. Do not turn around. Because right? it's There's, not going to be I will. I will save you. That's how much I love you. Is I will Dude, throw my... Testins, right? Oh, everywhere. yeah. The Reverend did a really good job yeah. with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio doing that. Isn't that what he got his Oscar for? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't even talk the whole time. Just screamed, <laughs> thrown around. Is that it all was, it takes? It's terrible. Well, dude, that guy is a phenomenal. Oh no, actor. no, he, it's he's been robbed for so long. I know. It took a bear mauling his ass. It did. I think there's one point where it like legit bit his ass and like threw him. Yes. That's an intense movie. I need to watch that again. Right. I love that. Like Viking culture, that's what they would do. They granted they had axes and swords and were trained warriors. I would, I bet that if I had a sword, I think I could take, but like with nothing, you're just, you're just killing time. Yeah. Did I tell you I forged a tomahawk? You did. Yeah. That's cool. Damascus. It was, uh, there's a guy here local in Castle Rock that forges, he was on Forge and Fire. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. His name is Sean Meadows. Oh, I think I know him or like I saw his season. Yeah. So, uh, highly recommend if you're in the local area, he does like classes where, where he uh, has railroad spikes. Oh, so it's mild steel, but it's still fun. You get the hand, you know, you heat it up, you get the hammer, you, you, uh, forge it out. Sure. And then after that, you, you kind of make it whatever you want. Yeah. Um, super cool, dude. Can't, That's like, awesome. And then, uh, so I hit him up after making the knife. And I was like, hey, man, a lifelong dream of mine has been to make a tomahawk. And he's like, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. Let's do a Damascus tomahawk. I've never done one before. How many times did you fold it? Uh, it's got 60 layers. Nice. Yeah. It's not, I'll show you afterwards. Sure. It's, it's pretty solid. It's got, I put a window breaker on the back of it so I can like break windows. Yeah. But it's all, it also like is a relatively decent hammer. Sure. Um, but yeah, helped me through the whole process. Uh, super cool, dude. So, That's awesome. And I think it, I don't know how much his classes are, but they're not crazy. Um, and if he's still doing them, I would recommend it. To, like, For sure. Me. No, I was. I like to say if I was teleported back to medieval times, I would become a blacksmith because one, just crafting things seems like a very fun occupation to have. Uh, but also, it, during invasions, blacksmiths were sa- were spared from execution because it's skilled labor. You can't just like take anybody off the street and say, okay, make this sword that can survive a battle that can be f- people who even know how to fold the mask yeah. of steel. Yeah. And that was like, I mean, one of the, the revolutions of weapon smithing is not just melting the ore together, but actually the, the more layers, the yeah. mo- some more strength it has. So Damascus is actually, and this is something I didn't know Damascus, the way we know it today is actually a relatively new process. Oh, yeah, it wasn't a uh, high carbon steel at all. Okay, and, I, and I'm really hoping he eventually comes on my podcast because he's more of the expert on this. But the, again, this is like secondhand information. Sure. But um, the process of Damascus was actually developed in like the 90s. Okay. The high carbon process. Right. Yeah. The 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 old process, which included mild steel, which a problem with mild steel is, of, of course, if you get if you hit a high carbon steel sword, it's going to uh, it's going to de lamb. So it's going to, it's going to hit and it's going to have like a, a chip. Sure. Uh, that or completely break. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating. The whole process. I felt there is nothing, there have been very few moments in my life that I felt like so much like right? a man it's, it's as cathartic. I'm holding yeah. this giant hammer Absolutely. and I'm whacking away at this, right. this spark of sparks flying, this hunk of steel, man. Right. And then like to work it while it's hot. You're like whacking the shit out of it yeah. on this anvil. You throw it back in the furnace. And you're like, okay, rest. I get 30 seconds. Right. And you're like, you know? Yeah. And like this, the Sean Meadows is a fucking beast, dude. He's sitting there. He's just whacking away at like side projects and stuff. And I'm oh, like, sure. how are you doing? That? How? how? I'm like, dude, I work out and right. like, you are, you are smoking me, but it would be definitely be interesting to be a blacksmith back then. I just think back like, 
uh to mighty python oh yes to monty python uh, like i think a lot of people initially assume they would want to be a knight yeah no that's and everybody yeah you you, you think that they're going to be the knight in shining armor it's like no you'd be a peasant unless you had a skill or were really lucky to be born into a, like a knight's family that was really yeah your your best shot at yeah, there was the the farmhand who was able to find enough food to build the muscle to become a knight. But everybody else is like 90% of the population is you're a yeah, serf knights, labor. <clears throat> knights were just bullies. Yeah, absolutely. They were just the guys that got the most food. Right. <laughs> and were big. Absolutely. Whoop your ass yeah, if you looked at them wrong. When genetics was a little bit more variable and it's like, yeah, they, it, there may be somebody who's just the mountain who rides and he's like <laughs> six foot six and just destroys you. Yeah. And then everybody else is like anemic and <laughs> dying of the black plague. I'm not, I'm not yes. I'm not dead yet. What? Yeah. So good. So you spent some time in Wilmington, moved to a yes. cold climate. Yeah. So moved up to New England and East Coast winter is way different than West Coast winter. Everybody's like, oh, aren't you worried about the cold? It's like, no, it's it's cold, but it's the dry cold. Yeah. So just wear jackets and a hat and you're, you're good to go. And the snow melts like two days back east. Like I understand why they salt the roads and you need a snow blower to clear your driveway. It's like here you can just kind of push it and you're good to go. Yeah. I get the leaf blower out sometimes. Yeah. It's all you need. Just blast it. Did you, uh, is that when you started your studies into anesthesiology? Yeah. So back in 2018, I had a pretty big surgery on my ribs. Mm -hmm. So I had what's called pectus excavatum, which is like spoon chest. I'm sure a lot of people who, know somebody who's got this varying degrees of severity but mine was severe enough that it impacted my breathing when i was exercising so like i said i played soccer pretty much from when puberty hit until about 18 my rib cage just kind of formed in on itself so when i would breathe i had what's called paradoxic breathing so i'd breathe in but my sternum would push in so i was really fighting myself to breathe so 2018 had the surgery which is basically like braces for your ribs where you just got two big metal bars across the inside of my rib cage kind of pushed everything out mm -hmm. that was a a long recovery but after going through all of that i really appreciated the anesthesia that i had that made that a more tolerable experience and i got a couple different aspects of that so i got it's called regional anesthesia which is like a nerve block so i had a, an intercostal nerve block for i don't know probably a t10 T9, T10 area for where they were going to make the incision and put the bars to kind of make that a little bit better for a little while. Um, so for the people that are just listening only, can you say that in layman terms? I know you're showing. showing sure. That. So it's uh, kind of at the bottom of the rib cage. Um, there's 12 thoracic vertebrae. Uh, so right around. So the 10th one down um, is right where they made the incisions. And uh, is that yeah. similar to like women getting epidurals during pregnancy? Um, so that is. For spinals and epidurals, we go for the lumbar vertebrae. Okay. We go for like L4, L5, because that's um, that hits the nerves that innervate the uterus. Right. Um, it's so yours was just higher. Mine was higher up, exactly. Okay. So it was like a very it kind of hits a band of nerves. So they hit, they went in around T10. So they had about it's called uh, a couple layers above and a couple layers below. There's kind of this band of. Um, band of nerve block basically right and then um also had what's called cryoablation of some nerves so they while they were in my so it was all done laparoscopically which is super cool what does so, that mean so they they cut um little holes uh in me to put little ports which they then inserted their instruments so it was all done with a, like minimally invasive so right. the procedure before what i had was called the savage procedure where they would literally cut across the rib cage pull the diaphragm and rib cage open put the bars in and sew you back up and it was like six months recovery to get that to recover from that understandably they would they cut through so much and then what i had was called the nus procedure which is a significantly less uh invasive much quicker recovery and basically what they did is they just put little holes in the side and then they passed the bars in and then flipped them but they they go in with cameras as well, so they ablated the nerves in the inside of my ribs, mm -hmm. so it was a little less sensitive. So for a little while, it's all my sensations come back. For a little while, I had about a hand size 
um, area on my ribs that I just couldn't feel from the nerves being frozen. The only experience I ever had with any surgery was my broken collarbone. Sure. Do you remember that? I remember. Yeah. yeah. So you John, crashed a dirt, bi- yeah. dirt bike. <laughs> That's yeah. why I will never get into dirt biking is because I know I will do the exact same thing. John, myself. John Faye was very, very good at dirt biking. Oh yeah. And I was trying to keep up with them on like a tiny little 85 CC two stroke. Right. And, uh, yeah, we, you know, the crazy part is I broke my collarbone. It was a full break. It wasn't a fra- like a, sure. a slight break. Yeah, it was yeah. full green stick rotated. fracture. Yeah. 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 Full. Yeah. And the only thing keeping it in was my, uh, scapula mm. was keeping the bone from poking out of my back. Um, so we drove from Sanford, North Carolina, all the way back to, uh, apex, I think yeah. is where wake med was. So all like an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. And and like collarbone fractures are like one of the most painful ones. Yeah. I don't want to say, you know, I didn't want to inflate my ego too much, but I'm kind of a big deal. Yeah. Now you're kind of, kind of made of steel. The, uh, so it sounds like yours was planned and I, and I only say this because when I went in, uh, they gave me oxycodone or something like that, but I had a delayed reaction to it. So I guess every, and you would know more about this. Everybody reacts to drugs differently. They do. So they gave me an immediate release. Sure. But it wasn't immediate. So I was going into shock at that point because it's been an hour and a half with a broken collarbone. Yeah, the adrenaline's wearing off I'm, and your body is kind of, okay. Yeah, I am fried. And sure. the funny part is I walk into the welcome center of Wake Med and I walk in. I have got no shirt on because EMS already ripped it right. off. I walk in. I've got like dirt all over me. I coughed up blood because of the impact. Sure. And the lady looks up from the desk and she goes, can I help you? I was like, and as I'm holding my arm, I'm like, right. I need to see a doctor. Oh, is this not Wendy's? My bad. I'm like, I need to see a doctor. I need to oh, see a doctor. Go out the door, take a left, and that's the emergency department. Thank you. I was like, okay. Okay. So I literally turned around. It's like, can I get know, a wheelchair? <laughs> I was like 15 at this time. Yeah. As I'm halfway out the door, she's like, do you need a wheelchair? Anyway, so I signed myself in, and they uh, they give me, I'm waiting, sure. like 10 minutes to finally get into the, uh, what do they call it? The like emergency when, room? Yeah, but it's like a uh, triage. Oh, triage. Yeah. yeah. So I'm waiting to see triage and I'm like waiting 10 minutes. So then they finally give me uh, an immediate release, but it doesn't kick in. So they, they check my blood pressure and everything else like that. And they're like, he's going in the shock. Because they, they kept asking me like, hey, how are you feeling? I'm right. Like, I'm like, I'm not feeling too good. Right. They're like on a scale. They look like shit. They're like on a scale of one to 10. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know, maybe like a five or six. And they look over at the charts and they're like, how are you feeling? Are, are you sure though? I had no reference point. Right. Like to exactly. me, a 10 is I'm dead. No, that's, and that's, what's funny is talking to patients after surgery is like, I, I'll do some like cataract surgeries on people. I, I don't do the surgery. I do the anesthesia for it. Right. But like when talking to them in recovery, they're like, it's an eight out of 10 pain. And you just like, look at the nurse. Like I, I described 10 out of 10 as I just hit you with my car. <laughs> and your whole body your, hurts. everything is broken yeah. everything hurts like okay yeah sure, i'm sure it's a very like i've had some really bad headaches that yeah. i'm like this is this is up there i yeah. wish i could immediately take take this pain away but yeah it's all relative yeah so so you're sitting there you probably looked just pale I, dude, and and that's the thing they kept they had me all hooked up sure. at this point so they kept looking at the charts and they're like hey his blood pressure is dropping his heart rate's increasing yep and like that, I guess that's like a immediate sign. Like, Hey, he's going into some sort yeah, of so shock. When um, you, when you're, you have that injury, your body just starts pumping all your like in, endorphins all out, just mm-hmm. your epinephrine, everything, the norepi that your body stores up for this emergency situations keeps your blood pressure up because you've lost blood mm-hmm. and it's someplace where it shouldn't be. And so all your body's just releasing all those, um, catecholamines. And then after what, there's only a finite amount of, those resources in the body. So once those start to wear off, then the body starts to compensate. So it's like blood pressure drops, heart rate increases to kind of counter out, yeah, counterbalance the the loss of blood. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause they, they ended up looking at, looking at me and they're like, Hey, we're going to get him started. Like didn't even ask me. Cause yeah. again, they, they asked two times. They're like, Hey, how you feeling? I was like, I don't know, like a five, <laughs> five or six. They looked, I shit you not looks over at the monitors. How you feeling? Hi, are you sure? And I'm like, what about a five looks back over. Yeah, go ahead and get them started on morphine. Right. And so they they hooked me up with the morphine. And dude, drugs are great. It's they're a fantastic tool. Drugs are fantastic. When you need them to work, 
they're great. Scared the shit out of me though, because the morphine starts and I don't know a lot of people say like the morphine isn't a psychedelic or it doesn't, I, it, it caused morphine hallucinations can. for me. Yeah. And to the point where, <laughs> and I was still very lucid. Sure. But the, uh, so the oxycodone kicked in and then I'm sitting there on morphine, the morphine drip. Um, and the nurse comes in, she's got just black holes for eyes <clears throat> and these like razor sharp teeth. Right. And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, this is cool. Everything's cool. Right. This is fine. Like, I'm going to be fine. And I start crying. And she's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And she's like, are you in pain? I'm like, I feel nothing right now, but I'm seeing some stuff that I don't think is real. Yeah. And she's like, oh, yeah, that's probably the drugs. And meanwhile, her teeth are like, right. <laughs> she's like, okay, don't you, focus you on they it. bet they are. <laughs> so, yeah, they get me into the MRI machine. And I didn't know this until years later. They put pictures on the ceiling when people are going to MRI machines. That is yeah. fucked up, man. Because whatever it's only that up when you're on some substances, dude. That it was like this beautiful flower thing, and then this dragon started coming out like towards the, me, and I was like, "This is whoa. too heavy." The last thing I remember in getting into your field and your wheelhouse is uh, I was pre-op sure, and uh, met with the anesthesiologist and they were like, hey, we're going to you know, give you whatever. And they're like, you, uh, you're not going to remember anything yeah. after this. And they're like, go ahead and count down from 10. And I remember counting. I was like 10, 9, 8, lights out. And then lights out. the weird part came back. Yeah. So they're pushing me down the hallway and I came back and I was like, after surgery, no. Okay. P like pre sure. And they're like, and I started looking around. I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm here. And they're like, no, you're not. I'm like, no, I'm here. I see everybody. I see you guys. I'm here. And they're like, no, you're not going to remember this. I'm like, seems pretty real to me. And I'm right. sure you can shed some light on this. Yeah. The so, last thing I remember. Yeah. And, and then I, I, cause I want to pick your brain. On sure. This, cause I'm sure you hear this shit. And of course, I'm like a teenager, so I'm super self conscious about my peen and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Right. So I'm, <laughs> I'm in my little gown, and they're like, uh, yeah, I've got, I think, uh, one, two, three, four, five, maybe, and then a six person yeah. crossed. They're like, hey, we're going to move them. And I'm like, oh, it's okay. I can help you. Broken collarbone. Right. And I'm like, you know, moving around. They're like, no, 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 no please stop. Please oh, stop. Oh, my God. And I'm like, no, it's fine. I, I'm, I'm okay. And they're like, seriously, stop moving. Stop moving. And uh, so. And then after that point, when I went from the uh, stretcher, the the transport stretcher sure. to the operation table, out completely out. Yeah, but I think it's weird that I remember the countdown until eight went unconscious, like the yeah. So well, what's what's going on there? So for for your listeners, so I'm an anesthesiologist assistant. So it's uh, you can draw parallels to a nurse anesthetist, but it's or like a physician's assistant that's highly specialized in anesthesia. So what's interesting is that they had you count in pre-op because that's – if they gave you something, they probably gave you something called a midazolam or versed, which is a benzodiazepine, which does cause the amnesia, what I call it, champagne for the vein. And it, it does cause some uh, retrograde amnesia where it's just pretty much every, everything after we give you that until it wears off, it's – it's fuzzy. So you, you'll have some kind of flashbulb memories, kind of like what you were saying, like down the hallway, you do remember that. Typically it's, it's enough to kind of usually just mellows you out. It's we, we, if you're under like 50 or so, most people are going to get that before surgery. Cause it just, it helps me keep you chill, chill in, in surgery on top of all the other, other things I'm giving you. Um, anesthesia is a cumulative kind of effect. So it's like you, you get some benzodiazepines on board, um, narcotics, and then anesthetic agents like propofol or anesthetic acid like sevoflurane. Um, it all adds together. And then that is what allows surgery to do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So they probably yeah, gave you some, some medicines pre-op just to help with the pain, especially since you came into the emergency department. If you're a, a more planned surgery, you're, you're not getting all those all those drugs to keep you comfortable because most people aren't coming in with bones that are like barely hanging together. And, Bro, it f me up. Right? Yeah. So yeah, you got you got some good stuff, I guess. But uh, so I'd, most people, like I said, get some some Versed because it just helps with anxiety. Um, and then 
I, I have had people, and, and that's what's so interesting is like, I've had people that they know what time it is when they go to sleep and they will tell me, they'll look at the clock afterwards and be like, I was under for an hour and 45. And I'm like, yes, you were. And like, they know exactly that. Or people who will like, they'll go to sleep counting and they'll wake up counting. So how does it work if, if they're looking at you? Yeah. Like, cause it, it cause sometimes there's, uh, I guess the average person would assume consciousness turns off when you close your eyes and you go to sleep. Right. Yeah. You just kind of like, but you, that's you not pretend to true. be asleep. Exactly. So anesthesia is all about understanding neurotransmitters, receptors, and how to manipulate that. So the basically the workhorse of anesthesia is what we call like induction agents. So there's a couple of different kinds. There's automidate. Uh, there's ketamine and there's propofol. Those are the, the big kind of big three that we learned about. Um, Atomidate is really good for cardiovascular unstable patients. Um, people who... Meaning what? So... Like... Sta uh, like so uh, somebody who is like a really bad heart, somebody who's like about to have like heart surgery or something. Okay. Or yeah, so just like a... So the, the heart, the, one of the metrics we use to measure it is called ejection fraction. So if somebody has a really low ejection fraction, their heart is like barely pumping any blood out. You really don't want to mess with like how much blood is being redirected in certain places. So propofol, which is like the, the it's the Michael Jackson drug. It's like sure. a really, really common one we use. Uh, most people will get that causes vasodilation, which can be really bad in some patients who are like barely hanging on their, their hearts. Like you look at it, you're like, how are you keeping this person alive? But, um, like I said, so atomidate, uh, ketamine, which is a dissociative anesthetic, um, which makes you, doesn't really make you unconscious, but we give it to you in such high doses. It's very uncommon to use ketamine as an induction. I should mention that. You'll see it a lot of times, like um, paramedics will probably use it more than I do as an induction mm -hmm. agent because it just kind of, you don't know what's going on. You're kind of in la la land. You're, you're really high. Uh, and then just allows us to do what we need to do. Um, but then propofol uh, hits what's called the GABA receptor in the brain, which is mm -hmm. also the same receptor that alcohol targets. So okay. that's, yeah. So that's like, if you like the old medicine, give them a bottle of whiskey and a belt, same thing. If you can turn the brain off, but keep the, the patient breathing, you're good. good enough. Yeah. And that's, that's the, like the first types of anesthetics, like mil especially like military anesthetics. That was all just kind of whatever you had laying around and that uh, alcohol is one of them. Yeah. That's intense, man. Yeah. So, so you've had, you've never had anybody look at you and be like, I'm still here. What? And <laughs> like, I, I like, cause say, I kid you not, dude. I was like, I was, I was no, pushing down the hallway. That's and I'm the like, thing is hello. <laughs> like, yeah. No, you're please don't cut me open. Exactly. No. And that's, everybody's af like afraid of like consciousness under and like awareness under anesthesia. Yeah. That would so many things would have to go wrong for that to happen. Yeah. Like your body would react and like your blood pressure, your heart rate goes up. That tells me if I'm doing my job right. So if, if you were to just be paralyzed and not unconscious, your heart rate and you'd be through the roof and then somebody would be like, Oh shit. Like I need to fix this. But like, I like to say anesthesia always wins. We just have to give you more of it sometimes. But like, dude, it I, was it was stressful. Sure. I was sitting there. I was like, no, 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 no. It's like that. Uh, uh, what is it? The Punisher? Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. No, like, no, it, people, it's always interesting being somebody in the medical field when people come in and they have no experience with the sure. medical field because they, they don't know how any of it works. And especially some people come in, they come in for like robotic procedures where they were like doing prostate, pr like re revision kind of removal of um, kind of excess tissue, gallbladders can be done. Like you come into this like, spaceship having never seen a doctor in 20 years and you're like, what is going on here? And we just tell you everything's okay. Take some deep breaths. You'll be asleep in a little bit. We'll see you when you wake up. And like, I don't know. It's what's funny about my job is some people you'll see varying degrees of seriousness. 
And like some people really lean into the bartender aspect. If I have a patient who's like somewhere between 25 and I don't know, 35, I'll really be like, Hey, I'm Will. I'm your bartender. Cause I, <laughs> I usually I'm about to knock you out, right? Hey, you want the good stuff? I got the good stuff for you. Hey, do me a favor. Just push that mic just slightly away. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Um, so you come in and you're like, what cocktail do you want? What's today? going on? Oh, <laughs> like I said, champagne for the vein. I'm, I'm your bartender. I take yeah. my job very seriously. It's all top shelf stuff. And uh, like I said, some people it's the humor is what helps kind of lighten that alleviate, up, yeah. alleviate some of the stress. We've all got, we've all got our jokes. One of my favorites, like, Oh, just let me know when you're asleep. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's great. Like some people, some people really fight it. They'll like, you'll, you'll see that they're like, Oh, and the, the eyes open up a little bit more, but then eh, everybody... Did you ever see that Steve-O Steve-O skit? Yeah, he, he induced or himself, skit, but he's like sitting there. Yeah, he going, had surgery. Yeah, and he, he pushed he pushed the own meds yeah, in like, his own. I'm still here. Yeah. And just like now just give it a couple seconds. Like, you can't stop the train. Yeah, <laughs> no. And that's that's what's so funny is like, like I said, people, some people fight it. Some most people just kind of like eh, drift off yeah. eyes, eyes kind of flutter a little bit and then I what we do to check how unconscious you are, we check the eyelid reflex. So I just like brush your eyelashes. And if your eyes kind of Twitter, Twitter a little bit, yeah. you're still, you're still there. If not, well, it's go time. The only other experience I ever had was, uh, so you know what PRK is? No. So it's the uh, procedure where it's a, uh, correcting vision mm. procedure instead of LASIK. There's sure. LASIK and there's PRK LASIK. They basically do almost a full circle laceration of your uh your uh skin on your eyeball sure. pull it open do corrections with the laser oh put the flap back and it's got that little area that's going to heal sure prk uh the best way to explain it you you know uh back when you're a child and you were tie-dying eggs sure. for easter so they take a little uh metal circle thing and they push it down in your eyeball they scrape your top skin off okay do the corrections and allow your skin to heal back naturally. Interesting. So PRK is known more commonly as a more longer lasting solution than LASIK. Okay. I just I, remember going in and they gave me a, I think it was a Percocet. Yeah, probably. It was a pretty high dose Percocet. Percocet or Valium. Valium. I felt great. Yeah. I felt real good. Yeah. So they that, put me in this tiny, tiny, tiny little room. Right. With like this really nice nature like show on. Oh, sure. And they're like, hey, just let us know when you'll when, when you feel it. Yeah. And I'm like, how will I know? How will I know? And then the, the nurse was like, oh, you'll know. You'll know. She closes the door, walks out. And I'm like sitting there. I'm like, OK, let me read a magazine. I'm like right. sitting there reading a magazine. The words start looking funny. I was like, yeah, the, the words start lifting off the page. Yeah. I'm like blanking my eyeballs. I'm like, what's going on? I start yeah. looking at the TV. The TV is like three dimensional. I'm like. And then I'm super, I'm so calm. I'm oh, like, yeah. Oh. So that's what Versed does, but it hits you like that. Yeah, it's Valium, fantastic. Valium was interesting. Yeah. I've done a lot of drugs. In, yes. Under, like. Under supervision of a yeah, medical Yeah, under supervision medical of medical provider. professional. Yeah. yeah. I've even done ketamine therapy for, yeah. like, uh, PTSD stuff. Phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it helped get past a barrier in my brain that I didn't even know I had up. No, Which that's pretty crazy. Like ketamine falls under the like the psychedelic cate category of drugs because it does cause like I said dissociative anesthetic. It does the K hole, dude. The K hole. We drop you. That's when we use it as medicine. We drop you so far in a K hole you don't even know what's going on. And then we we do other things, we but pull like you back out. then we pull it, we let it wear off. Like today, I was doing some spine surgeries, and that's the the one first guy. Everybody's different what I used for the first guy would have been overkill for the second person because sure. I, but she was, a, uh, I guess a little more, she had had less surgery. So she was a little less, um, le her body was, had had less experience using the drugs. So it was yeah. like, you'd needed less, but the other guy, he had had both his knees, both his hips, his shoulders replaced. So like his body kind of re resisting my, my medicine. So are they using, uh, psilocybin or DMT? No, not in surgeries. No, really? Yeah, it's a well, I feel like because I've talked to a lot of people that have used DMT and sure. they say it's very disassociated, like they leave their body. Oh, sure. I don't know what the time frame on that is, though, because like ketamine for 
like what I use it for, it's a pain adjunct. So my, okay. the guy I gave it to, he was already unconscious. He had some narcotics on board. He had other things on board, but he was still, he was still reacting to having a tube down his throat. So ketamine, just a little bit here, a little bit there was enough to just chill him out and just let you, you overbreathe them. So it's like your body produces carbon dioxide. There's a, a when you breathe it out, there's an end tidal carbon dioxide reading. So that basically 35 is kind of like a normal person. If you're just sitting there monitoring your breathing. Mm -hmm. So if you over breathe them, you breathe whatever, 16 times a minute, various volumes, you can take away the body's need to breathe. And that makes sense. And kill them. Not to kill them, but you just, you take that 35 down to 30 and then that. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I no, thought no. you were saying take it down to zero. Like, no, no, no. Yeah, breathe. <laughs> no, no carbon dioxide. No, that's when, the, when you go from 35 to zero, that's when they're having a heart attack because oh, there's okay. no, the blood's not moving. There's no circulation. There's no circulation. Yeah. There, the carbon dioxide just building up in the blood and what is getting that's moved terrifying. is like, yeah. So I moved to Colorado because everyone's much healthier. I did my training down in Texas where we joked anybody over a hundred kilos or like 220 pounds is a Texas medium. Yeah. My 600 pound life is filmed in Houston, Texas. One of my classmates was in one of those surgeries. Everything is larger in Texas. Every, everything's bigger in Texas. The sweet tea, the hats, yeah. the people. Yeah. But it's, I, I love Texas. I, I loved the training I got. I will say the, how long was your school? So, my so I, I kind of cut you off right. halfway through, but you went to Connecticut undergrad. Undergrad. You were going to do physical therapy, yep. and then you switched. Yeah, two years applying to programs. Got to the interview stage of a few programs, but it was just not – I wasn't the right fit. Um, like I said, had surgery. My dad actually passed away in 2018 as well, which is why I moved back down to North Carolina to be with my mom, kind of pivot. And then I was actually looking at becoming a nurse anesthetist, which is if you're not already a nurse, like a 10-year route. So I was like mentally preparing myself for that whole process. Went out to dinner one night with my mom or one afternoon with my mom. It's like 2 p.m. on a Tuesday. Yeah. And my, we overhear this family at the next table over and like talking about, oh, yeah, I get to wear scrubs and I'm out, out by like one o'clock every day. And my mom was just like, well, what do you do that allows you to do that? She's like, oh. my son wants to be you. <laughs> no, she was like, I'm an anesthesiologist assistant. And I was like, what is that? And yeah launched into it and told me all about it and that was my connection to indiana university which has a program i went out there for some some job shadowing as well as some shadowing with that lady in wilmington she worked at an outpatient surgery center doing tonsils and various little dude i i always think like carpal tunnel releases and stuff without these small little interactions right your life would have taken an extremely different route it's so small too. It's so small. Literally, like if my mom had not talked to that lady, if you didn't go out to dinner, if we didn't, if we what had if not you're like out in lunch, traffic and you're like, you know, I'm like so frustrated. All right, we're just going to cook out. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Like, I'm like, ah, what, what are you feeling? Let's let's go Mexican instead of this beach food. You know, yeah, like, sounds good. Yeah, so that that got, so, that was my I'm connection. So so happy that this is all panned out. Mostly self serving because you're here in Colorado. I get it. But like truly talking to you in high school and we're all kind of have that existential crisis, you right? Know, of like, what am I going to do? Like, yeah, you're all, it's all fun and games. And then you have to be an adult for the rest of your life. Yeah. Like, what the fuck am I going to do with my life? Yeah. And I, I knew I was going into medicine. That was yeah. like since ninth grade, eighth grade, I knew I was going to do something in medicine because I, one, I knew it was job stability, good pay very that very interesting field to me mm -hmm. at least so i initially thought like i don't know become a pharmacist but that's like because that's one of the highest paying jobs but it's also one of the most amount of schools because you also have to understand drug interactions like i use a very small scope of medicines like most people get pretty much a very similar cocktail of medicines for me for most sure. of my surgeries but like prescribing medicines there's a lot of interactions between drugs that you have to worry about so that's pharmacal like pharmacokinetics yeah. and dynamics and stuff so pivoted to physical therapy and then it's like well if i can't catch people after surgery i'll help them through surgery because i was somebody that helped 
helped me through surgery. I really appreciated. So, yeah, it's so the shutting off of the brain that you guys are, you guys being the anesthesia I team. Guess, team. Yes. Um, or I would, I would say field, right? Sure. You guys have more understanding of cognition than almost any yeah. other science. Which is funny because if you start to really look into anesthesia, we don't actually know how it works. We know why it works. We know what receptors we're targeting and we can target them very precisely, but we don't really know how anesthesia works. We just, it's like, if somebody, somebody described it as like, the brain is like a, a radar wheel. You're just spinning, scanning. It's as if the thing that was, was consciousness, it just completely passes over. It just, it's unable to register mm -hmm. what's going on. Nothing's going on. And then we stop doing what we're doing. You kind of come back up and then your brain starts to work again. That's so weird. Right. So you know what I know, it's doing. Yeah. But you don't know how. We we don't or you know how or you don't know what. Well, so that, and that's what's ago. that's what's so cool about being in the medical field now, watching medicine develop. Sure. Is like there was first there was morphine. Yeah. Then there then came Dilaudid and fentanyl, which fentanyl is for me, a very potent tool. It's a very short acting medicine. It only lasts about 30 minutes or so from when I give it to you. And at peak time is about eight to 15 minutes. So it's great for like induction or like, Oh, we're, we're making incision that first part of surgery until we get to where we need to get to. And you're like in your spine or your arm or whatever, call it yeah. what we're doing. That initial approach is usually the stimulating, stimulating part. But then after that, it's less so because it's kind of, it's everything's pulled out of the way, but, um, yeah, cause we have less nerves on the inside of our body. Exactly. Yeah. So that's like people who get IVs in their hands will complain more about propofol. It's kept in a glycerol solution, which burns. It, it feels like it's burning in your vein, but if you have a IV in your forearm, it doesn't hurt as much because there's less nerves around that area. How do you feel about the thought process that we're just like meat computers? Oh, yeah. I look at the surgeons. They're basically just meat mechanics. <laughs> what? It's just, I mean, and once once the drape is up, it's not a, it's not that it's not a person anymore, but it's just they are mechanics fixing a part. Sure. Or removing a bad part. So it's like you go in, we're taking your gallbladder out. Yes, it's still Susie, but it's it's less so about like it, and that's why I would ne I would have a hard time doing anesthesia for you is because I would have a hard time separating you and my emotions for you from the job. For me, I have to kind so of when I'm looking you in the eyes and I'm like, "Will right? I'm still here? Don't let me die. Don't, I love you. I have a <laughs> wife and kids. I'm like, Matt, you're having your wisdom teeth taken out. It's fine. You're Dude, gonna be fine. I, side tangent. I got my wisdom teeth taken out, and uh, what do they give you? Nitrate nitrous oxide yeah yeah a little pig nose so i <clears throat> so i'm sitting there and sure. i knew kaylee at this time and they gave me some sort of post-surgery medication that made me trip balls it was, they probably gave you valium then too that when i had my was maybe trip, out, it was not a good trip it, it was it'd it be like that sometimes it'd be like that sometimes uh but the initial trip of me getting sedated i literally got ripped out of my body and i'm sitting there looking at the room and i'm like Oh my God. Yeah. This is crazy. And then I was like, let me get back. Right. Let me get back. And then I just got sucked up into this like whiteness. Sure. And I kid you not. And I wrote this down and my mom. I, I hope she still has the napkins because my mom picked me up. Sure. And I was like, pen and paper, pen and paper. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, cause I can't talk. Right. right. Oh, you're, like, like, you're just, your mouth's all <laughs> but numb. I, I knew I was like, I can write this down. all over yourself. I can write this down. Yeah. So I'm sitting there pen and paper. When I got ripped out of my body sure. and it's still as vivid as this day, there was Mohammed, <laughs> Jesus, our God in the middle. And then Jesus. Yeah. And they were, they were all three were standing there and they were like, we are the same people. You need to go back down there and spread the and, word and tell everyone to stop killing each other. We are the same. Yes. We're all one people. Smacked, back, smacked back into my body. 
I was I was like looking around the room. I'm like, is it done? And they're like, you know, right. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> surgery's like, all done. It like, went yep. well. Yeah, uh, dude, that one's brutal. They shatter your teeth and everything. Oh yeah. So anyway, um, really glad to be out of my body at that point. Uh, but I get in the car. I'm like, pen and paper, pen and paper, and I write this down on a napkin. Yeah, and I just keep writing. My mom's like, "What are you writing?" And she's reading. And she's like, mom. "She's like, oh my god!" And she was like, she like got all teary eyed. She's like, "This is so beautiful." And I was like, you know, I wonder, I wonder how many of the original scriptures were just like accidental psychedelic exposures. Well, I mean, if you look at a lot of early early religions, that's it all re- revolves around like I don't know, ayahuasca, different yeah. mushrooms. Argot. Yeah, argot, different different psychedelics. I mean, yeah. you're you're this hunter gatherer society, eat did a hear, mushroom. Did you hear Moses, uh, the burning bush was actually a DMT bush? I'd believe it. Like the the leaf of the bush that was burning produces DMT, which is dimethyl titrate? I guess so. I don't know. No, yeah, sure. Anyway, sorry, but no, but that's, that was that no, was, that was psych- quite psychedelics have been a, <laughs> a a major influence on religion and kind of the human psyche. How do you feel as a as a as a medical provider? Medical provider, and I would say more in tune with like the most up to date stuff when it comes to uh, revolutionizing the anesthesiology field with utilizing psychedelics so i i look at medicine as a tool i think sure. that's one of the biggest things like I, I have met lots of people as soon as you mentioned like oh i do anesthesia they're like oh do you take any medicine like no those are such powerful tools that i am given the the responsibility of handling because i am trained on how to use them i think that there's a time and a place for mushroom therapy for ketamine therapy because the way that those drugs kind of, I don't think there's necessarily a place for psilocybin in the medical, like in my profession, because sure. it's, it's such a long acting substance. It can last anywhere between like three hours and eight hours. And then residual side effects can last days. That's a little long acting for what I do. But I think I, I was reading something. I was describing a psychedelic experience is if you imagine the the mind as like a hill with a snowfall, eventually as thoughts, actions, events happen, you make these ruts that your brain just naturally starts to follow again. Well, a psychedelic experience is like a fresh snowfall. You can reestablish new connections. You can make different paths you hadn't made before. And that's why therapies work is because it's like, I've been hiding this. I've been really repressing this at this side of the hill I really avoided until the right, the right scenario, the right trained people have those conversations that make you, make you fall down that side of the hill and really kind of reestablish or draw new connections. Yeah. I could see, I could see the hesitancy to use psilocybin. I would be more interested to see studies coming out of like prolonged use of DMT. Excuse me, DMT. Yeah, now that's that's not a a common drug that's used, right? Like it's very much like I know in in rave culture, it's it's pretty big. Like you, you can find, especially certain genres of music, you'll find um, a little more prevalence of those kind of substances. But like when I look at patient charts like occasionally you'll see cocaine you'll see methamphetamine use you'll see psychedelics you'll see opioid use but like very rarely do you run into a a lot of dmt use Mm -hmm. because it's from what i've understood it's a pretty short acting yeah i've got uh i've got a i've got a friend of mine that's used it before and uh it was a one and done sure and uh he was suffering from substance abuse uh five minute trip sure five maybe ten yeah and uh yeah he wouldn't talk about what he experienced he said it was really beautiful it was really moving it's really self-reflecting sure and then from that day on he stopped drinking yeah frequently yeah like you said sometimes and uh i was knowing this individual to come out of that experience i was like okay well wow that's pretty profound sure. and uh i do know that sanford uh, is that the U? No, what's the uh, what's the UK university that does a lot of 
not Oxford, Oxford. So Oxford is doing a study right now with prolonged DMT intravenous therapies. Intravenous? Yeah. Intravenous therapies. Um, and there's an individual that has a Instagram. I wish I knew his name, but he talks about, he was the first, one of the first people to be administered DMT for 40 minutes. Wow. Yeah. That's a long time. So the interesting thing about DMT too, though, is it's naturally occurring. Yeah. So similar to like adrenaline, like an EpiPen. Yeah. It gets out of your system super quick because your body's like, oh, I yeah. know. I know what I've this is. I've got this. I've got let this me, on tap. Let I know me, exactly what uh, to do with what's this. What's the process of breaking down things? What is uh, that called? Bioelimination. Yeah. So it's it's very quick as far as like getting back to a homeostasis. Sure. Mode. Yeah. Your body knows how to process it. Yeah. So uh, it's it's interesting in that regard because it's. I don't know. I've never sat down with somebody and been like a trip sitter. Sure. For anybody that's done that. And uh, I don't know if they're like truly, I don't, I wouldn't like, it'd be interesting if you ever run across somebody, you know, do the eyelid test to see if they're truly. Yeah. Like how, how conscious are they while they're experiencing this? I mean, like, I feel like, are you going to med, are you going to a doctorate school soon? No. I was about to say, you should start your doctorate on this. Right? No, I, I am very happy as a mid-level anesthesia provider. Yeah. It's uh, if, if you're looking for a, a profession that has a good work-life balance, uh, great pay, and you get to do really exciting stuff, anesthesiologist assistant is the profession for you. If you're medically inclined, it's a tough profession. It's, it's hard. Yeah. I won't lie. It's the first year is like 18 hours of classwork on top of like 30 hours. You don't mind me asking how much you guys make when you come out. Um, so depends on the the state you're looking at. Um, here in Colorado, the average starting salary is about 180. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, but there were some places, um, it's also like, Oh, am I 1099 or my contract employee? Sure. Um, so, but there, there are some people who took jobs making 240 straight out the gate. It's they have to pay a little bit in taxes, but sure. if you open up like LLCs and stuff, yep. like there's a there's a married couple in my practice um, that they're they they have an LLC that they mm-hmm. are able to write off certain things like I think commuting costs and, yep. and stuff like that. It's a lot of money. It is. I have a hell but, of, I have hell of student loans. I was about to say, yeah, that. I've got about that much in student loans, student loans, so. But hopefully in about three years, I can have that paid off. Yeah. And then whatever that some people like I, I have the benefit when you're first out of school, you've made nothing for the previous years. Mm-hmm. So your student loan payments are really low. My mine's only like 500 a month right now. Mm-hmm. There are people who have over like 2000, 2500. Some people are paying more student loans than they are on their mortgage. And that's why I'm just like waiting for the downfall of our society because yeah, I've got a uh, I've got a buddy of mine that's coming on hopefully uh, soon that that used to be a financial investor and uh, we're going to talk about some of that stuff. Is it Herman? Nope. No, oh. no, but he is he. I, I I should reach out to him too. Yeah, he'd be great for the housing stuff. Sure. Um. But oh this, yeah, he'd be really interesting to talk to right now. Stocks. I've given but, up on the the hope of buying a house. You really lucked out with when you when you were yeah looking to get a house and got a house because now it's well we're stuck here oh yeah this is where you'll die this is yeah, fantastic yeah. this is a, it's a good spot it's yeah. a great great spot I'm and gonna keep digging like i've got a basement i'm just gonna yeah, like just keep expanding gonna, yeah what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna like dig out the wall and just get a pickaxe and just keep like digging out to right. build the who needs a gym bin. i have a pickaxe and a wall exactly be like where are you getting all this dirt right just dumping it on the side of the street yes <laughs> No. How does, uh, so with the revolution of AI coming into almost all career fields outside of, and I, and, uh, I will say it's starting to come into law enforcement a little bit, not as much as I think it could, which is something I'm exploring, but how does it work for you guys in medicine? Yeah. Cause what do you, what do you, what exactly are you doing? so So you put in the order for the drugs and then the, the actual anesthesiologist, Sounds no, awesome. so I'm the hands. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. So in our we have what's called an anesthesia care team. So I've got an attending anesthesiologist who is a MD doctor of anesthesia. He is overseeing between three and four rooms, uh, but in those rooms they've got either anesthesiologist assistants or nurse anesthetists, and we are fully functioning 
individual care providers. So when I look at my cases every day, like all the medicines I gave, I didn't check with my attending if I should do that. And I was actually giving him suggestions on like, oh, I think this person needs a scope scope patch, a scopolamine patch, which helps with nausea. Um, I think they need this. And he was like, sounds good. It's like, okay, I, that's so I did that. I went out and got it from the our Pixis uh, drug dispensing vending machine, basically. Sure. And get this little patch. I, I was like, okay, here you go. Stick it behind your ear. And then that's when I gave my first head right before they rolled back to the surgery. But like all the decisions, all the, the care is done by me. So, um, I mean, there are hospitals that all the anesthesia is provided by anesthesiologists, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a way of providing care without needing everybody to be at the same, like their, their understanding of anesthesia is phenomenal. And like, I don't go into the cardiac rooms. I'm not doing the cardiac bypasses. I'm not doing the, the big brain big. Yeah. Do I'm, they turn well, off the brain? Yeah. So, and surgery? we do, we do extra, we turn it off. So we, um, you can, when you give propofol, you it's, the brain can be monitored. So you're asking about depth of depth of sedation basically is what, what you're asking about. So there's, it's called a BIS monitor, it's a bi index spectrum monitor. And that will basically out of a hundred, it'll tell me how on your brain is. So anywhere between 40 and 60 is a good depth for anesthesia. So today, because spine surgery is really cool because you have to, there's a lot of moving parts and you, sometimes you can be paralyzed. Sometimes you can't because they're monitoring, like, oh, we're putting hardware in the spine. We have to make sure we're not messing up the nerve signals going down. We don't want to put a screw in your spine or spinal cord and make you paralyzed. Sure. So there's a neuromonitor in the back who's telling them, oh, there's this amount of impedance or whatever. I don't really know how that whole profession works. Somebody's watching. Someone's watching. Someone's looking at there's these squiggles on a laptop in the corner and they're like, it's over 30, <laughs> over 30. And that's all I hear them saying. I'm like, cool. Um, but in brain surgery, they, they really want to make sure that like, there's no activity in the brain when they're working on it. So if you give like a, a bolus or a big push of propofol, you go into what's called burst suppression, which is where your brain is like off, off, like three neurons are firing and it's all like in your, the base of your spinal cord. This How do they you. track that? So. Cause I know there's those, uh, we have a mon. We, it's little stickers I put on your forehead. Okay. It's for brain surgery it's a little more difficult because they're operating on the brain. Yeah. But like for what I was doing, we were doing lumbar surgery, so it was like it's nowhere sure. near it. So I can have whatever. Have you done? Have you done open head brain I have, surgery? Yeah, yet? yeah, I've done. I've done the being in Houston, Texas, where my program was located. We got to do some really cool surgeries. So we did. Um, so for Parkinson's, one of the surgeries they think you do a deep brain stimulator. So in order to make sure they are in the right area, you have to have somebody awake while doing brain surgery. So they're in this like heart. Yeah. You're talking about being awake during surgery. They literally do that. So they're in this harness. Are they the, conscious though? They're conscious because well, we ask them to do things. So I've got you under sedation and it's, it's basically a dial of how, how unconscious I need you. So it's like, we've got you here and they're like, okay, get ready to start waking the patient up. So we have to wake them up enough that they are like able to do things, especially for Parkinson's. Cause we're like, is this, is this making your hand better? And then we, we poke a certain part and it's, it's better. And you're like, holy shit. Like putting a, an electrode in this person's brain causes their tremor to completely go away. And so we ask holy. them, like, we ask them like touch your nose and they're like, and what you run into problems is like, I, the, one of the people I did it, he was like a 75 year old guy who had really bad back pain. So he's like, oh yeah, I'm just really not uncomfortable. We're like, sir, we need you to stop moving. Like we are in your brain. We need you to stop moving. And so it's, it's intense. Like, have you seen that video where the lady is like playing, playing violin? violin? Yeah. Yeah. She's sitting there she, as they're like, obviously you don't see her. Brain. Yeah. yeah but it's all behind the did. drapes. Yeah. <laughs> like I Show me the goods. I just think it's so interesting because no, I, I work with, I work a lot with computers sure. and it's so baffling to me that the brain can be on tinkered is, with. No, 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 no. Just at the end, it, it is literally an electronic charge that is causing 
all of this. It's all electronics. My, my and perception of everything, my feel, my smell, this interaction. You're like 90% of what goes on in your brain is just sodium channels going off. So crazy. Right? We put it on our food. How do we how do we go from the interface to memory? Because I guess that's one thing that's interesting about those procedures. Sure. So that's we're starting to leave my scope of practice, my uh, understanding. But I, I do have a I was really interested in the brain. I have ADHD yeah. and definitely am on the some kind of some spectrums here and there. But I was really interested in the brain in undergrad. So that's why I, I ended up like one class short of a minor in psychology because I was just taking classes I was interested in. Took some drugs, drugs and behaviors, some developmental psychology, some cognitive uh, behavioral classes. And sorry, train of thought lost. So going from the actual oh, formation of memories. Yeah. So it's all through the hippocampus. Okay. So drugs I give you interfere with that. So that's like what you got when you were counting down. I don't know why they had you count, but yeah. I think you, you probably asked if you needed to count and they were probably like, sure. <laughs> like, probably. Probably like, <laughs> yeah, like, whatever you want to do. Like you knew this me at that point. Exactly. So like, it was like, <laughs> this isn't where it starts. You can count if you want to, but yeah. like that, that's, I just, I, I think that's hilarious, but no, like <laughs> the drugs we give you basically just kind of, I said, it's that radar suite. It just kind of, it stops stops working it's just so what is it again this is probably going into well we don't really know what's going on we just know it's working yeah is it stopping those neurological because you can't stop neurons from firing right if that if you got to tighten it down you can yeah no no little screw right here um it doesn't stop the neurons from firing right i mean that's what birth suppression is is your neurons stop firing because there's there's parts of the brain that are conscious thought sure the cerebellum all like the, the the outer parts but then as you get into the brain stem all that stuff i, I am drifting I gotta stop mm. fidgeting with it here hold on we're gonna take a quick break because i gotta pee okay really sounds, badly sounds good and then we'll come back because I, I gotta pick your brain a little bit more okay uh, we're back we're back so interfacing with the as, as far as like the user interface that we have day sure. to day right so you guys don't turn it completely off or you do we you said there's certain drugs that that do stop so yeah the... so it's i i have to make you there so there's certain aspects of when i'm looking at like what i need to do for the surgery it's like how unconscious do i need to make you so we can do what's called like mac or monitored anesthetic care which is just like sedation so if you were to have like a carpal tunnel release or something where like if we just give a little bit of lidocaine in the area, like yeah. that numbs up it enough. You just have to like not care that we're doing something to you. And then, so that's, how do you test that? Do you just hit them with like a pin prick or something? Yeah, like pretty that? much. Like, yeah, do you feel this? Yeah. I mean, that, like that's for labor or when we give you a, a spinal for when you're giving, when you're giving birth. Um, it's yeah. So we, brother. <laughs> we, yeah, anybody can. Um, we, we give you our, the spinal, we give you the, usually it's, um, bupivacaine that goes in, in your in your spine and then we literally will pinch you and we're like get a toothpick or yeah. like a blunt tip needle and we poke you in your legs and it's like how when do you feel this and we we start in the legs and we go up to the belly and then usually it's like right around kind of like the nipple line that's like oh that's that's t10 that's usually what we're shooting for because then it's like we know mm. that when we we cut across your red your belly button you're yeah. not gonna feel it so hmm. for if you have like you're saying for like a cesarean a cesarean section yeah okay. but for like a carpal tunnel they'll just give like some local anesthetic in the area and then i give you like a little bit of propofol a little bit of Fersed, a little bit of fentanyl just to kind of like make it more comfortable for you but then yeah. most people you basically just take a nap you're sitting there you're snoring you're breathing on your own i'm just <laughs> a medical babysitter i'm just watching you breathe and then like i'm talking with surgery and then when surgery is finished they're like okay i turn it off. I'd stop whatever infusions I've got going on. I turn the gas off and then you wake up and you're just kind of like, Oh, that was nice. I had a dream about whatever. And then you're like, nice. And then we just take you over to the recovery area and send you home. But then yeah. we can do what's called general anesthesia, which is like, Oh, we need your gallbladder out. We're fixing your, we're doing a knee replacement. 
oh, well, knee replacements you can do with a spinal and some nerve blocks, but like big procedures like, oh, hip fracture. Could you ever be like if they if they need to do work on my leg? Sure. Could they ever like be like, nope, do a nerve block and I want to watch? Yeah, we we've had some people ask to be like more awake, but like, why would you want that? I want to watch it. You want to watch it? No, like, I mean, there's that. A Russian surgeon back in like 1940 something that like did his own appendectomy or something like that. I'm pretty sure he got a spinal to just allow him to just do what he needed to do. But aside from that, like, but the, the other thing is like, we don't want you talking to us. <laughs> we just need to do the job. So it's like, sometimes like you've got some really talkative patients that you're like, yeah, I'm just going to, you don't say like I'm gonna put you to sleep because you're talkative, but you're like, oh, it's it's okay, just just go to sleep. We just need you to be sleep with us. I just imagine like again going back to that surgery table is like, yeah. Oh no, I'll help. I'll help. And they're like, no, 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 please, no. Don't. Please, please don't. Yeah. No. What's interesting is like I said when when you kind of turn the brain back on, what kind of gets kicked up. When with veterans, something you have to worry about is like Vietnam syndrome, especially old veterans. Yeah, like they'll wake up fighting. Really, their their on switch is like, let's go. Like yeah. the enemy is around, and like younger. So the when the brain wakes up, it'll react before you're aware that you're reacting. Yeah, especially in younger people. So like a young athlete like us in our prime yeah. back in high school doing, doing sports and stuff, we would probably have woken up pretty agitated just because our, our bodies are awake, but our brain is not fully engaged with what's going on. Yeah. The reasoning portion of the brain is, is completely not, off. Yeah. yeah. And so you're like, it takes you a little bit. You're like, you're waking up from surgery, stop moving. And like, I don't know how like PACU nurses, like the post anesthetic care unit nurses, I don't know how they do their job. Cause I feel like you would just be like, it's okay. You're waking up from surgery. It's okay. You're waking up from surgery. It was very strange. I won't go into too many details, but there was an incident that where I got to experience somebody that was coming straight out of anesthesia, sure. out, like anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I could see the switch. Yeah. That was like, you know, interacting, interacting switch. And it was like, what's going on? I'm what well, I'm here. When did you get here? Right. You, and I was like, like, I've been here for 20 minutes. Yeah. You're, you're watching all this. We've happen. had a full conversation. You signed four contracts. Yeah, exactly. No, I know so much about you. How's your yeah. wife and them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is interesting to see somebody kind of like, uh, the light bulb kind of turn. You on. can see it. Yeah. Cause you, you, there's definitely like there's, there's awake and then there's oriented. Yeah. There's definitely the like oriented. is, And that's board. when yeah. we talk about, when we give our handoff, we tell you like ahead of time, they were alert and oriented or like they don't know what's going on. They did not, not sign oriented. the consent for themselves. This is me getting her hip replaced. Yeah. Her daughter signed the forms for her acknowledging that me needs to have her hip replaced. She is yeah. going to wake up and we, we always worry about like post-op delirium. The older you get, the more likely it is because you just, it takes you a little bit. And you're like, where, where am I? You're, you sure. just had, you just had surgery. You're in St. Francis hospital or whatever you're at. That's so interesting in the in the essence of like memories and stuff like that and in uh where the brain takes us. Right. Like even even uh it's it's a cool thought experiment to even close your eyes, think back to a particular moment. You might not remember the day, you might not remember the time. Sure. But to think back to that moment and close your eyes and really focus on it, it becomes so real. Oh yeah. No, it's like my happy place is this spot in the Appalachian mountains where we took a break one time where there was just like the stream and this nice, like I, I can put myself, I can smell the dirt that I was standing on in yeah. that. Like that's when I need to ground myself, I put myself there and that's like, was it grandfather mountain? Uh, no, I think it was oh. uh B mountain was okay. the, was, it's the, yeah, it's uh the exact part of it. It's, it's part of the Appalachian mountains. It's interesting in the, in the fact that that memory is just neurological. Oh yeah. Firing. That's it. Yeah. No, I saw someone's like, there's, a, there's no way of like a hundred percent knowing anything beside yourself is real because it's all just data being processed by your brain. Like yeah. I, you're wearing a, what I would call it like a salmon colored shirt. But if you were to see your shirt with my eyes, you might say that's green just because that's how your brain is interfacing it, with it. 
is processing that information. Yeah. And then you get the people that argue like, oh, well, color's coming in at a different wavelength. And I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't define how your brain is interpreting that data. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that. We are, I think there's, a, there's a higher likelihood that we are dealing with a simulation than we are not. Yeah. And just, and that's just based on like anecdotal stuff. There's some quantum physics that go into that, but like no, I, on one of your other podcasts, I think it was Griffin. Yeah. Maybe he mentioned it. Neil deGrasse Tyson was saying, if you look yeah. really into the, the, the math of the universe, you yeah. see computer codes. Yeah. It starts getting a little, and like, and, I'm still at the same point as I don't know what to do with it. I don't think it changes any perspectives that I have. Right. Um, but it's, it allows me to look at the human experience and my experience with this world in a lot more peaceful way. Yeah. Knowing, knowing that there's probably that simulation going on. Sure. But speaking of simulations and the, uh, you know, the full fledged, onward trajectory that we have with uh simulations and sure. AI, AI. And, and and so so AI the the reason why I say I, I correlate the two is because I feel like AI will be the future of simulations. Sure. If you're going to make a simulation you want AI almost uh you know the point of the point of uh, singularity sure. to happen and then AI exist in their own little simulation and then you could have an entire universe in that simulation. Yeah. So, uh, going to AI and kind of what you do. Sure. So what are you guys, what are you guys seeing in that regard? So there are, I've definitely, I've read some studies about like anesthesia machines that you can kind of program that it's like, Oh, I want the blood pressure parameters to be this. I need, like I said, there's monitors that can tell me everything, like how unconscious you are, what your heart rate is, blood pressure, oxygen levels. So, uh, basically you could in theory, program a machine like especially with machine learning and how advanced ai is becoming but the problem is a lot of what i do is it's procedural it's actually placing the airway it's placing the iv so there's a lot of stuff that you can't do with an ai like i'm i'm sure in, in 100 years there's going to be a there's a robot that's going to be able to place ivs with 100% 99% efficiency sure. but like i don't know waking a patient up i had a she was like a 29 year old female the other day getting her gallbladder taken out she laryngospasmed i don't know if it, how what fast so it's when if so anesthetic acids cause different phases of sedation uh stage three fully asleep stage one awake stage two we call the excitement stage so that's when your brain is on but you're it's only your reflexes that are really kind of functioning. You are not in control of your body at this point. If you mess with someone's airway right around that time, their vocal cords will slam shut and called the laryngospasm. And then you'll try to breathe and you'll you cause ne negative uh, pressure, pulmonary embolism, like or, um, various lung conditions. So it's, it's kind of bad. So you can fix that though, but, I don't know how fast a machine would have known how to do that. Right. Um, I had some instructors that said like anesthesia is 50% knowing what to do and 50% making it look easy. There's definitely an art of anesthesia. So it's, it, I don't know. Is that the, we don't fully understand the, the capabilities of AI. So sure. There's, there may be some point where AIs do take over, but from my perspective, there's a lot that is outside of what AI would be able to do. And also just being able to physically interact with the patient. Like I, I was looking at some articles leading up to this that were talking about like how AI is used in medical field. And a lot of it's like ultrasound guidance, um, radiology uses AI a lot to identify certain things that they may overlook. Um, but as far as procedural medicine, I think it'd be really hard to create a machine that could do what I do with the reaction time that I have. Sure. So could you see yourself doing it more or utilizing it as more of an interface? Sure. Yeah. They, they're, I mean, a lot of what I kind of rely on is like you, you have your 
machine that's giving you all these all this information you're processing it but then you set alarms and yeah. like backups of like oh blood pressure has dropped to this amount so kind of that adaptive learning you could say like oh these are kind of like the normal parameters this is what you should be watching for and like what i i like to par- or describe what i do is i'm like the goalie in a soccer game like if surgery goes well Nobody's looking at anesthesia like you're the rock star. You did it like I allow surgery to do what they need to do. I let them score on the other team when things go badly. It usually gets looked at. What did what did anesthesia do wrong? What did we give? What did we not do? And that's where it's like that's. There's so many variables that you have to take into consideration and like I have to rely on like my know machine learning that it, it does take a re- retrospective look at all these different things that have happened. But like I rely on my own knowledge base to mm-hmm. say, Oh, that's what's happening. And as I've started practicing, I've been out of school for about a year and a half. Now my reaction time has gotten significantly faster. So it's like, Oh, I know what happened. I knew I recognized literally just passed immediately in that girl and I fixed it. But I don't know it's hard to say that a computer would be able to acknowledge that and then like intervene with anything. Yeah. But in a fast enough time and, and yeah, I in, think... in an appropriate manner too. Yeah. I, I do get freaked out. Have you ever seen, um, uh, ex machina? Yes. That freaks me out a little bit. Like the, the if you have a, what it makes me think about this is like, we see those robots do surgeries. Sure. There are some that do like very, very small incisions, very small, like heart valve yeah, surgeries and, I mean, like, and stuff like robotic that. Robotic surgery is a thing, but usually it's a surgeon controlling the robot. Sure. I'm sure you, you eventually there'll be a capability of it. Oh, what sure. would freak me out is if I saw a humanoid robot with synthetic skin sure. walk up to me, look like a human, be like, hey, right. I'm... Chat GPT 76. <laughs> Sur- you know, like- Surgical add on mode. Yeah. Yeah. Can- Imagine like going through an entire surgery experience without interacting with a single person. Like the person you check in is a kiosk that you've answered all your questions. Like, oh, here's my medical conditions. And then you're a light turns on that you go through a door mm-hmm. and you sit down and a big ass robot with multiple arms. That would freak me out. The Da Vinci X 76 that comes in and places your IV and then breathe deeply and just holds a mask on you. And then another robot comes in like, and it knows too, like you're not breathing deep enough. You're yeah, I can. Yeah. It knows. It sees like, yeah, you're, (laughs) you're still about 35. Now you're, you're end your, uh, my pulse oximeter is reading only 97%. Yeah. Please take three to four deep breaths. Yeah, exactly. In one, two, three, out. Um, I think we're, I think for some things we'll be there. Sure. I think for like replacement. It's hard to. Replacement like stuff. It's hard I to completely we'll replace somebody. Cause like, yeah, you could probably. A prosthetic. I'm thinking and not, not, at, not at a joint. Sure. So like below the knee. Good example. Yeah. Clean cut. Yeah. The interesting part for me would be, and you could probably touch base on this is like, I always had a fascination with like an Anakin Skywalker hand. Yeah. Right. And I know I've seen some videos on the internet. Oh, sure. Yeah. Prosthetics are coming along, especially like hand prosthetics are really They're they're connecting with nerves to where it's like the brain. And I think with Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink, it's going to be huge. Uh, especially with not the, not necessarily needing to connect with the existing nerve system, but being, having the option to control other things through like Bluetooth. Yeah. An EMP goes off, you're screwed, but yeah. Right. But I guess how much of that do you see? Um, connecting of nerves. Sure. So I, I think that. I said the brain's super interesting to me. It's I've always been fascinated with like how it works and like why his mind worked the way it was. And if you really start like looking at kind of like nerves and nerve innervations about muscles and everything, and like sorry to kind of sidetrack. Uh, in my undergrad, I, I did a study or I helped out with some research that was uh, aimed at helping paraplegics. Um, use muscle groups that they may not be able to 
necessarily control voluntarily Mm -hmm. with like nerve stems. So kind of projecting that a little bit into the future, like I could definitely see there's some pretty cool, pretty cool ideas that you could come up with. Like, I don't know if you've seen uh, cyberpunk edge runners Mm -hmm. really good. It's like, yeah, what if we replace someone's spine with this thing that allows them to like process a thousand times faster or like, Oh, it gives a super strength. Like that's not outside of the realm of possibilities. I would 100%. And I know I asked a uh, previous guest this, but I would 100% get some, some get, cybernetic, cybernetic augmentations. Yeah. To a certain extent. Sure. Right. Uh, I would want like, there's, there's something that's very uh, human about touch. Sure. Right. So if you didn't mess with my touch, that's fine. Yeah. But like processing. Oh yeah. So like if they're like, hey, we can replace your eyeball. Yeah. Give you like a smart and, lens. Yeah. Or perfect. Yeah. It, especially if it's not full removal and inserting. Yeah. And inserting a new uh, piece itself. But I, I also think of like if I had the option to connect with Neuralink and then have immediate access to to phones. Yeah. You know stuff. No, like. That. like uh, I find myself looking up like, oh, you, you'll get patients that come in with various like diseases and disorders. So you're like, I've never heard of this. Yeah. To be able to just be like, scan it and be like, what's that? And then just like think, boom, oh, it's a yeah, clotting disorder. And like, oh, neat. Good to There's know. There's a good show on Netflix that uh, it's called Upload. Sure. It has, uh, it's mostly based on afterlife, but it does have some interfacing with like people living now sure and a lot of what they have is they you know they don't have phones anymore everything's on their hand Mm. so they open it up and a little screen populates between their thumb and index finger interesting and they can interface with their phone there and i'm like you know what that would that would probably be the next step for uh any development in our integration with technology sure is going to be some sort of uh virtual reality augmentation through proxy of like a neural link sure. into our yeah, brain. some kind of like user interface. Yeah. It was like a like video game kind of displays yep. where you've got I don't know what your inventory is going on, your messages. Yep. You're over encumbered. Yeah, exactly. By life. <laughs> All the time. You have bills, groceries. Just uh, time. adulting. <laughs> Could you imagine? It's like you're you're at work and your tolerance level, your computer in your brain's like right. you're done. Yeah, you're so done. So you go into your boss's office, be like, "Hey, my uh, tolerance is done for the day." Exactly. I've... Go ahead and uh, share that with me real quick. Right. Like, yep, go home. It's like, wow, your stress levels are off the roof. Yeah, you should definitely, uh... dude. Honestly, that might be the solution to a toxic workplace. Right. Right there. But anyway, man, I've got to have you on again because there's just so much I want to pick your brain about. Absolutely. I appreciate, uh, as I tell everybody, time is the most valuable resource that we have. So I appreciate you. Appreciate you coming out here. Um, And I appreciate the amount of years that we've just known each other and like you giving me the time of day. Yeah. Um, Good people are hard to find. (sighs) Yeah. I don't, I would, I would, I appreciate the comment or the compliment. Of course. And, uh, yeah, man. Like I said, I have to have you back on. For those listeners, I appreciate your time and uh, and giving us the time of day. Everybody, will thank you um, for having me on. Make sure you go over to the snepodcast.com. Make sure you sign up for the first to know uh, newsletter. I send out on the fifteenth of each month the roster for next month, and the importance of that is you can submit your topics you want to hear, the questions you might not hear. It's not a guarantee that your questions or topics will be covered, but it does give me a good idea of what you want to hear about. So make sure, again, go over to the snepodcast.com and sign up for the first to know. You can follow, like, and subscribe on any social media network, and I appreciate your support. That subscribe button seems pretty petty, but it means a lot to me, especially in the analytics that I look at. So thanks once again, everybody. Take care.